It's a real thrill to have Gavin Grenville Wood on our podcast with us. And visually, welcome to my hotel room in New Orleans at just before 7 a.m. in the morning. Gavin, where in the world are you right now, my friend? Uh, I'm just south of Oxford in the United Kingdom, and it is 12.50 p.m., nearly time for lunch. <laughs> yeah, you're busy teaching already, I'm sure, and I'm busy preparing for a broadcast. Okay, let's dive into this. Um, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this entire thing, um, I want to put you into perspective for our audience. Please uh, share the short bio with us and how you came to where you currently are with the Lead Better people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been coaching and specializing in teaching children for about 25 years. Um, I guess um, after I've been involved in the industry um, on and off for the first few years as an assistant and, a, and an apprentice, um, I went to the United States from the UK to teach at a summer camp in mm -hmm. Philadelphia um, just because it seemed like fun um, whilst I was at university. And actually, Where was at university. Uh, Brunel University in the yeah. UK mm -hmm. and um, I saw this ad come out for um, coaches to go and work for the Julian Krinsky School of Golf and Tennis um, and actually he was uh, he was South African uh, and he was hilarious and the minute I walked <laughs> kind of have that uh, we, we've got that way about us you know people find us don't know about if it's hilarious or if it's just comical uh, anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> it was good, but uh, no, I just felt I felt right at home, and and um, I ended up going to work there for two summers with a whole bunch of South Africans, and we would teach for the six seven weeks of the of the summer, and then we'd share a days in motel room whilst we caddied at Merion Golf Club. Uh, so eight of us in a days in motel room. Um, Have you written a book about these uh, escapades. Oh, these are fantastic, uh, especially Kiwi Neil, uh, who's um, in whose uh, green 1967 Buick um, I lost my thumb fingernail in. That's a separate story entirely. But, <laughs> hey, let's but you know, to the golf show. That could be a separate podcast entirely. But look, um, I, I fell in love with the uh, inverted commas American way of, of coaching kids in summer camp. And I came back to the UK and still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I didn't want to earn or go back into an industry where I was earning 45 pounds a week as an apprentice again. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I kind of bided my time a little bit and a job came up in central London at this nine hole course with a driving range that was the same size as a bowling green, a crown green bowling green. You know? Really? Um, and this driving range was 45 yards long and it had... Um, three sets of RSJs, totally enclosed by netting. It's a fantastic place, but it's in the heart of London, right? So okay. chimney pots galore. And I went and applied for the job and I got it there on the spot and it was phenomenal. Um, and so that was really the birth of my, um, I guess, love affair with coaching children. And it wasn't my idea to teach groups or to do this after school club. It was a lady who said to me, um, would you mind teaching my son and two of his friends and I'm like okay that's fine I'll have to charge you accordingly so I did and then the idea just grew from that um but the summer camp program was was what I copied from what I'd learned from uh, the Julian Krinsky camp yeah. and um you know for the next 20 years or so um I did my own thing and built up my own academies um you know all of them kind of grew to around coaching 400 kids a week um, all of different levels, both out in the community and back at the club. Um, and actually, it was late in in twenty, uh, well, mid mid twenty eighteen, actually, that um, I was uh, put in touch with Ben Riches from uh, Ledbetter, and I had my job interview with Ledbetter, walking round nine holes of the Ryder Cup. Sounds about Paris, right. <laughs> which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah that was it and i just I, I loved the fact that there was now this vehicle to help me reach my professional goals which yeah. was literally just to get as many kids playing golf as possible um having tried to spread myself across multiple facilities previously this seemed like a great opportunity to create a team of disciples who would naturally kind of go out there and do it the the way that i'd learned 
um, and without falling into the same pitfalls. Mm -hmm. So um, here we are today and, and things are moving apace. So it's, it's great fun. Yeah, uh, highly respected, of course. Um, and you use the term pitfalls. I think that's a great way to, place to kick it off. Um, because you, the head of junior instruction for Golf Zone, led better. Um, and I'm a longtime golf teacher since 1996, and I'm a father since 2007. And I have my oldest now who's into it, who, you know, used pitfalls last night. I was on the telephone um, with her after a very bad day at a tournament um, where, you know, the whole thing where just after a perfect day's pre preparation the day before, nothing went right. And you, you, you know what that is. Um, you know, when there's not tears, but just you could hear the just dejection and disappointment in the voice. So, so let's start there for mums and dads. Um, I, I just want you to give the overarching advice to kick it off, and then we'll, we'll mine from there. So as you're talking to the mums and dads of kids now beginning, uh, tournaments, elite, whatever the case might be. Share your take, please, Gavin. Well, I, I've, I've got one perspective, and I think it's the overarching um, perspective that will help you navigate uh, through what can be really tough times. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is to absolutely embrace that failure is part of the process. Um, you know, You're starting you know, you know, gospel 101 starting over there but you know it's it's one thing to say that and everyone's like oh yo we're going to do this but it's entirely mm -hmm. another deal when it's yeah. happening and it's in front of you like this i know it, it's if uh i mean hindsight as we always say is a wonderful thing but um i wish that i could uh i could go back with the knowledge I have now and, and help both of my boys. And my eldest is on the brink of breaking through. He's a, he's a professional, has been now for, for three years, four years, but three because we've lost one with COVID. Um, but, you well, know, the- They're being part of the process now. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And the realities of life, right? It's, it's not yeah. just, it's, that, that's the thing uh, to your point. It's not surgical, you, you, you can't, just compartmentalize this golf stuff it's it's life really yeah yeah it totally is um it was very difficult emotionally i think um you know as a parent you'll understand that and if if i could have prepared let, let's just speak about josh my eldest for a moment if i could have prepared myself better for the troughs that he went through then we would have enjoyed the process a lot more. Okay. And I think we might be a little bit further down the road. Anyway, we'll never know that. But, um, you know, emotionally, it ripped you to pieces. You, you know, your guts, your heart, just you were in tatters. I've got this picture, amazing picture um, of, um, of, of Josh sat on a bridge uh, at a golf course, not a bridge that, that crosses the Hudson. But um, that's not that big a deal, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was. We were playing an AJGA event up in Connecticut, and the greens running must be 14 on the stib meter. And, and he was having a torrid time, you know, coming from, uh, from Georgia, where we lived at that time, playing on Bermuda, to going up to Connecticut, playing on, on these really super fast bend greens. Couldn't putt to save his life. And he was just sat on the bridge waiting to tee off on 18. And it's such a lonely a picture and image that just spoke a thousand words and that was the only time in his life that he'd really ever wanted to quit of course we had a very long journey back down to Atlanta from Connecticut at that point um and you know there's there's sometimes there's just nothing you can say to yeah. to the kids um and you, you just have to let let the process ride out is it okay um, not to say anything in that situation oh god yes it really is. It really is. Um, I mean, you want to, to prepare the kids and say, look, right. And you have to, this is a constant barrage of the same message. This is going to be an up and down journey. It's going to be really difficult at times. It's going to be really easy at times. You're going to cry. You're going to laugh. 
you're going to be angry, you're going to just be excited, you're going to have all of these emotions, which are metaphor, golf being a great metaphor for life, you're going to experience in later life anyway. Amen. Preach, brother. We've got to learn how to deal with it. It's not about avoiding it. It's learning how to cope with bad days. It's learning how to play your best golf with your C game. Mm -hmm. um, also understanding that you're never really ever going to play your A game. Very rarely will you have 18 consistent A game holes. So it's about arming yourself with the tools and the skills to cope with these troughs that you will inevitably go through. And as a parent, I'm going to be here to support you through that because I know you're going to go through it. And I know I'm going to feel pain as much as you, but we're going to do it together. And I think that's probably the gospel really to, um, to help parents through this. Okay. Um, I want to mind that a little farther, further. Um, the, the putting on the brave face thing, because you know what it's like. You've just shared a very personal story there that I appreciate. But moms and dads out there, like I'm in New Orleans on assignment. My wife was with my daughter who had a horrible day yesterday. And I was just getting text messages with scores um, per hole. And then I spoke with her briefly and you could just hear how she was struggling and she was putting on the brave face, but it's so hard. So equip the moms and the dads for this. I mean, because you, you talk, you used the term gutted earlier, uh, which, you know, it's what it feels like at times. Um, help the moms and dads to say, look, no matter what's transpiring in front of them, this is, I've got to be, you know, the support I've got to be when they look over that individual who sees light, who, who sees, yeah. who, who sees the comportment showing that everything's going to be okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, you know, when you, when you have bad days, it's, it's having the presence of mind to just take a step back and say, okay, so let's just, let's just take a look and see what happened mm -hmm. and find areas that we can use to learn and improve ourselves next time we go out. You know, uh, with golf being, uh, I think, one of the sports that uh, where you mature the latest, I think it might be the, the latest sport that you do mature at, oh, really? apart from maybe chess. Okay. But um, you, you've got a, an incredibly long time. Parents think that they've got to, they've got to be peaking at 17, 18 years old. You know, and that is so not the case. The journey's barely begun. At that I'm glad point. you brought that. I'm really glad you brought that up, Kevin. And it's really pertinent to you, Mark, because you coach a college, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You're you, you are a, you're a stepping stone still. You're not the you're not the destination. And yet, so many people think that you've got to be at your very best by the time you get to college. Absolutely not. You have got rough diamonds coming to see you, mm -hmm. and you spend four years with them, and they are literally. Um, transferring through that four-year period with you and then they're going on to the next thing yeah but you know even when they've left you they're they're still four five six maybe seven years out from getting anywhere near the destination oh man that's reality uh, that, and and i'm glad you bring that up and and i think it's a, a perfect segue um and, and incidentally I, I i still struggle just mere culpa here for people listening and watching um with being that individual now, with my college team, when I'm watching them, I'm able to sort of not give them the blank stare, but be the guy that's, it's okay. You know, I'll, I'll say something if it's necessary, something not critical, but something just to change the mindset, perhaps, or the comportment. But as a dad, I struggle with the fact that my daughter's going bad and I've got to be like, everything's going to be okay, because golf is such a real part of who we are. Yeah. So it's reality. I think if you embrace it, it's okay. But I'm glad you brought up what you did about the growth, because I find, and I want your take, the goal, the goal setting, I think, for moms and dads and kids is a miss oftentimes. And I think sometimes the goals that are set are inconceivable, maybe, mm -hmm. sometimes yeah, yeah. Just, just completely out of whack, and they put unnecessary pressure on uh, the young one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when, when, uh, when Josh was eight, we, we, we sat down and, and he's got ADHD and he's, uh, autistic to an extent. Um, 
And so we knew he, his journey was going to be different and challenging, right? We were already having major problems with school. But we sat down and golf has always been a vehicle for him to be free and okay. to express who he wants to be. And that's why it's been so fantastic. But um, we sat down and said, right, I think we've got a 10 year plan here to get you into college because you clearly have aspirations, even at this young age, to play the game at the very highest level. But let's just take this one step at a time. So as much as we said, right, we want to get into college and we want to get a scholarship, uh, we've got 10 years to do it, that we didn't really structure anything specifically, right? It was a case of, well, we're going to keep playing. We're going to keep having fun. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to make sure that uh, you learn the mental side of the game, the, the physical side, the technical side. And we just take it as it comes. And I think the one thing that I will say that's a big plus in our corner was that we the, the goals weren't rigid. We could move them. And that's the thing. You know, when he got to 18 and he got his college scholarship and went to college, Mark, he only lasted one semester because it was a, hor a horrendous experience. The coach, yeah. I don't have much, many great things to say about, to be fair, but also he got lost in the education mm. and he couldn't cope with the demands of being a, a student first and an athlete second. So it, did, it clearly didn't work. But, you know, I'm very grateful that we didn't commit 10 years of rigid structure to this because that would have been a disaster. Yeah. Um, I love that, that you sort of malleable with it. Now, I want you to stay where you are, but build on it too, because then there's the expectation element of it as well. Mm. And parents' expectation, um, kids' expectation, loved ones, all that sort of thing. I think all of this stuff in the end, it all ends in one place, Gavin, as you know, and that's squarely on the shoulders of the individual with the rubber hands on the end of the golf club, with the hands mm -hmm. on the, the rubber end of the golf club. And so I, I want you to stay where you are because this is fascinating. And and then talk about the expectations and managing that stuff. I think it's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did just want to say that the, the, the two years of, of junior golf when he was 17 and 18, just before he went to college, were absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. We loved it. And we look back at it with such fond memories because he got, um, he got fully exempt on the AJGA and could therefore pick and choose which tournaments he could play in. And, um, you know, the experiences that that organization provided him were absolutely invaluable. I have nothing but great things to say about the HAGA. Um, so we, we thoroughly enjoyed that. And that was really key, I think, as well, making sure that we did enjoy that as much as we didn't have a university lined up until quite late on in that process. Okay. Um, we also moved countries as well. So we weren't continually in the United States. He was, he just turned 16 by the time he'd moved, we'd moved back to the States. So we didn't have a whole lot of time. Um, but we, we, we chose to, to take on this broad range of experiences so that we could enjoy that process. Um, and I think that was a, a huge savior. But when we got to college, um, I think it, it um, it became quickly apparent that this wasn't going to work. Okay. I think um, golf quickly went downhill. Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact he was in a familiar place in South Carolina. Um, but it was, just became a massive struggle. So in the November of his uh, first freshman semester, I said, look, we're pulling you at the end of the semester. Let's get out of here whilst we still have... A, a vague amount of sanity left right. and he's like well what are we going to do I said well we're going to pack your suitcase and we're going to go back to the UK and we're going to turn pro um, knowing that the, the equation for me at that point was um, I felt that he would become a better golfer after four years of having tried to turn pro and go through that experience versus four years then of, of going through uh, being a student athlete and I, I felt that at that point, that was going to be a better outcome and learning his trade and then having him feel like he needs to accept responsibility for his own outcome. So there were no, there, there still are no definitive goals um, or, no, goals is wrong. Um, 
as in a definitive timeline for anything to happen. That's movable, right? But he is now starting to compete on a world level after the three, four years <laughs> that we've had. He's competed all over the world from the Philippines to the US to the Middle East, South Africa, um, different parts of Asia. But traveling by himself at 20, 21 years old, mm -hmm. learning how to cope with being by himself, learning how to cope with different languages, very strange food, mm -hmm. um, different customs, different cultures. And I think that at 22 years old, he has a, a very rich set of experiences that will cope, that he'll be able to cope with um, as his golf then starts to really pick up. And as much as lockdown presented an opportunity for, well, uh, prevented him from competing effectively for the last 12 months, it did present the opportunity for him to develop his body and to okay. just change a few things. So I still think positive things have come out of it and we're simply ready to go for um, Asian tour when that kicks off, where he's got some status and in advance of that, some challenge tour stuff. But in terms of a timeline as a parent, there is no timeline. You want, you want it to happen really quickly because the media always talk about the success stories, mm -hmm. right? Jordan Spieth was here at 20, Tiger was here at 20, Will Zalatoris, whoever, right? It, and it's you, you cannot, as a parent, not start to compare these freaks of nature because that's what they are to your own child's journey. It, it's, gotta, it's different. You've gotta, your child's journey is your child's journey. And if you set the right foundations in place that your child will evolve when the time is right. Yeah. So try not to worry about what other people are doing. Focus on, on your own house. Yeah, you've got to work um, hard on, on those expectations too, because um, we can be in the eventually handcuffed by these things. And then you start making rash decisions. And, oh, and, and, and as soon as those rash decisions happen, I'm sure you could comment. Um, then again, the focus shifts from mm -hmm. playing the game, learning the game, dealing with, dealing with the game to like, yeah. I should have been here or I, I should be there or, or yeah. I'm off my timeline. He's playing a tournament at the moment, Mark, down in Brunswick, Georgia. Yeah. And he didn't have a great day yesterday. Um, and um, I, got a, I got a text uh, that said, that's probably the worst I've hit the ball in a very long time. So what do you think my response was to that? Well, knowing you, it would be something to the effect of, well... Yeah, put it behind you. That's what golf is. Uh, just clear. Try and try and get some clarity of the mind and and go at it tomorrow. Uh, my response was my first one liner was uh, no big deal, buddy. You'll figure it out. There we go. <laughs> and then he said it just sucks because the course is so scoreable and so soft. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Make it happen tomorrow. And that was it. Um, and and the thing is, we also when when your kid, regardless of the age of your kids, right they know that they've not had a great day. Mm -hmm. we, we don't need to dig any deeper. We don't need to open the wound any further. And we are very guilty of that, I think, as parents. I've been guilty of that. But that's so I've hard because, you know, we sort of do this maybe to appease ourselves, to make yes. ourselves feel good in the process. We, remember, we need to remember as parents, folks listening, it's not about us. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. So um, have you ever seen... Um, do both of yours play? Uh, my little one, she sort of dabbles, but not really, no. Okay. So have you ever seen your eldest miss a putt on purpose? Um, well, I don't have the luxury of watching as much as I would like, given, you know, my broadcast commitments. So, so far, thankfully not. <laughs> no. But, you know, I guess, honestly, watching lots of golf uh, with, with lots of parents in attendance. I, I've never seen it happen. Yet the reaction of some parents is that the kids do things on purpose. Mm, yeah, you're right. You know, the, the first thing out of their mouth is, what did you do that for? <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's widening the wound right there. Um, the kids know they feel bad. And um, what we've got to do is to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Amen. No wise words. One more question for the parents, and I want to dive into the kids' aspect of this. Um, 
I get so many questions about, okay, what events should the kids go to? And, and I find, again, I use the term rash where all of a sudden it's like, well, now my child needs to play events or my child's playing the wrong events. And, and parents are talking with each other. And the next thing you jamming this child into events and stuff. And, and the poor kid is just not going in there with a sense of calm that from my work on the PGA tour, everything these guys are doing is to, tr to try and create tranquility around them. But now it's racing from here to there to this to that, and I should be here, and I'm not there. And so, so please advise advise on tournament selection. Um, I would pick great locations to go to, okay, as opposed to specific tournaments to to create this broad and this rich experience that the kids have. Um, we had we went and played uh, Jordan Spieth's tournament in uh, in texas um and it was just amazing going to austin mm -hmm. uh what a fantastic city that is great people great golf course but it was a long way to go yeah. you know it was a road trip and a half and and we could have played an hhga that was much closer you know we did this one up in connecticut we've been down to to jupiter um we went uh, to down to alabama um so we wanted to create experiences that, that were memorable, that, that we could experience as a family. And I'm, I'm very happy that we did that. So it, it, was, it wasn't as much about, I mean, look, you can get ranking points for most junior tournaments now in the US. The junior golf scoreboard is, is pretty broad. Um, I would guess that you're looking to get enough stars to be able to compete in HAGA tournaments because they are fantastic. Um, and it's a building process. So, you know, whether it's um, IJGT or, or the Hurricane Tour or whatever it is, um, pick the location. If it has to be close to the home because uh, it's expensive to travel, then so be it. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, you're working your way towards trying to play at the, the the higher level because that's exciting for the kids yeah. so that's motivating and we can't discount competition either true uh, and, and along those lines um i'd love your take on sort of winning at your level before you progress to the next because i'll never forget my mom said this to me she's like new level new devil oh and yeah I, I think too often we sort of are, are sort of out racing in our minds where we should be going. And then you go to the higher level and you get beaten up. Uh, yeah. what, what say you on that for the parents? Well, each, each step up is, is um, another journey into uncertainty and, and being uncomfortable. Um, and I think uh, you can't, if you're being, if you're comfortable, you're not learning or progressing. And I, I think you need to be appropriately challenged. But then as parents, we also have to understand that when you do take a step up, there is going to be some, some tougher competition yeah. and, and some more challenging times ahead because you know, you, you've got to raise your game. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be better, you have to challenge yourself to that. So I'm, I'm okay with being challenged, but make sure you do your homework before you uh, you go into it. Don't just assume you've got all the tools because you certainly haven't. And it, your, your team, which is your coach, uh, you as the parent and, and your child, the three of you need to be well versed on what the process is. I and, noticed and you, uh, so you, you listed a coach and a parent, not necessarily parent being coach. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> You're directly We're somewhat unique, one. I think, Mark, aren't we? And um, you know, I've, I've, we've always had somebody there that's been a coach that's been on our team. So, um, you know, we, we've we've made sure that there's been three legs to the bar stool. It, uh, I, I, you, you, you open my mind so much always, Gavin. Um, I've got to ask this. There's that very fine line between motivational, parent loving, and then the coach who sometimes has to take the stance. Uh, let's 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 investigate there a little bit. T talk about that. Well, the, the coach is is um, is a little bit like the buffer zone and, and the voice of reason sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, I, I equate this relationship like a three-legged bar stool, Mark, and I don't know why I've got an alcoholic analogy with kids golf, but <laughs> in order for the stool to function, all three legs of the bar stool have to be the same length, mm-hmm. right? otherwise it ceases to be, a, it will just not be a bar stool, it will, will not be functional. Yeah. If one of the, if the parent, the child or the coach's aspirations are out of whack, then the kid's golfing journey will not be sustainable, right? There's no equilibrium there. So I think the coach's role, um, apart from preparing the child for what lays ahead, is also about preparing the parents for what lies ahead. Mm-hmm. Right? The coach has to be in control of what skills need to be learned in order to, to um, achieve that level, that the standard for that required level before they move up to the next one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely um, the voice of reason, I think, for the coach. All right, cool. Okay, um, for the kids listening here, um, just quickly, you, you've, you've talked about failure being a part of the process. You've talked to parents about sort of being, just love on the kids and be motivational and be their place of comfort, I guess, if I had to summarize. Um, and then the kids, I think at times, especially nowadays, maybe, you get that special one that comes along and just seems like they just naturally gravitate to the grind of it. But most people are sort of butterflies and they pop in here and they're like, oh, golf. And then I want to play something. Then golf starts going badly. Then they check out. Um, talk to the kids, the, the young people listening to this a little bit about practice, you know, sometimes hard work. I well, know all the times hard work, but sometimes tough work and being uncomfortable in the journey, um, as you call it, the journey into uncertainty. Yeah. Can, can I let you into a secret? Please. I hate the word grind. Okay. Well, I stand corrected. <laughs> Only because that has negative connotations. Okay. How much of the word grind uh, is is enjoyable? Nothing. My coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair play. I stand corrected. Right. Um, but the point is you can... Hard work doesn't have to be unenjoyable. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I think practice has to be uh, purposeful and it has to be fun. And um, I think practicing in pairs, um, practicing in a, in a competitive environment. I used mm-hmm. to love practicing with with a couple of friends around the chipping green, you know, playing games who can win. You know, it was it was wonderfully educational, but it was also very real practice. Yeah. I mean, of course, we've got. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you say that because it can quickly, with a young person, become a bit of not necessarily doing the right thing. It's just messing around. Now, I'm I'm fine with you know having to hit a certain club or could I do this one left-handed or, or sort of create scenarios that might happen. But you know, when you next thing you're just jacking around there um, and wasting time, that sort of gets my blood boiling. Some. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's got to be. It's got to be within certain parameters, and I think coaches are doing a much better job today of creating environments where kids are free to express themselves, but within the right parameters. Mm -hmm. And you do need to inspire creativity because golf is the most creative of sports. Um, But equally, they've got to have the skills to be able to allow that creativity to materialize. So block practice does have its purpose, um, but I wouldn't get bogged down with that being part of the only part of the process that you've got to balance it out with, you know, random practice and regular forms of competition. And it doesn't have to be um, structured competition. It can be casual competition, like I've just described, whereby you're putting into practice the things that you have learned in your block practice mm-hmm. and you're testing yourself, right? Competition is great. And I think it's very inspiring for kids at whatever level it is. And so as a coach as well, it becomes food for progress and and, um, it it arms the coach with information which they can use to improve the individual. Um, So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, experiencing failure. I mean, I I often say that competition is only a problem and winning is the only outcome. Um, And for me, there's a context to that. You know, if you have 50 kids, well, no, if you have 10 kids in your class as a coach and you have a competition and there's only one winner, I think that could be a problem. 
But if you have 10 kids in your class and each of them have their own individual goals that they're trying to hit, then you can have 10 winners in a competition. Mm -hmm. And if you solely focus on winners all the time, just based on score, that's the problem. But I think that uh, you can create a competitive environment where kids are responsible for their own progress. And that becomes very healthy then. Yeah, I'm a big one for sort of modifying par for the individual. Yeah. You know, where, yeah, you want to beat old man par, you know, using the Bob Jonesism. But your par may be 42 on nine holes or whatever the case might be. And as much as what that stings, that's just keeping things a little real and it's making the goal achievable because golf, as you've listed and we all know, and everyone listening to this knows, you know, I mean, you can get let down in the blink of an eye and you can go from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows oh. in, in a matter of minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is gut wrenching because it happens for no reason. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, say that again. It happens for no reason because... We, we live in this era now, you know, I think back in the day, 15, 20 years, folks were a lot more kind of like, okay with it, because there wasn't so much data. But mm. now there's data for everything. But there's yeah. so many immeasurables in golf. Oh, like totally. you say, there's no real reason for a sudden change in form. I mean, it's, it's real, because there are just so many variables in our game. Yeah, totally. I mean, you just, you just have to turn the corner to the next tee box and feel it, uh, uh, an unfavorable gust of wind that starts getting you thinking about stuff. And, you know, I don't think we ever, we ever hit bad shots ever when we are 100% committed or confident in an outcome. Mm -hmm. All right. When we, when we become uncertain, that's when we, we, uh, we let bad shots creep in. And um, I think it's that, that feeling of uncertainty can happen at any moment um and you you have to prepare yourself for that in, in different scenarios of course you've you've shared so many things that are helpful to even the parents or you know adults listening to this to to improve their games and you made a comment earlier i, I want to mine um to help everybody but especially the young person you know that doesn't necessarily understand the golf at the real granular granular level where it's like you said still be competitive with your c game and, yeah. and I remember Nick Felder says it to me honestly. Oh, I'm honestly and often he goes, "What's your plan B? What's your plan C? You know, it's, it's not always just plan A. Well, you find people preparing for plan A, and then when plan A fails in the first five minutes, you know, where do you go? But no one's prepared for that. Yeah. Um, is it just mindset? Or, well. You know, it, it is, but I think it also comes from, at a very early age, Mark, kids not being too technical, mm, right? Yeah. Because, you know, what we should be doing with, with younger kids is teaching them how to play golf, right? Yeah. Got, playing golf is an art form. It, the art of getting the ball in the hole is, is the skill, right? And, and however you do it. And also teaching kids, you know what? If you catch one a little off the heel, and it moves left to right on a low trajectory, but still finds the fairway. That's okay. If you catch one thin and you get a hole in one, embrace it because you yeah. did everything you could. You were still trying to hold it. The fact that you caught it off the bottom groove is irrelevant. You know, bad shots, bad strikes don't necessarily mean bad shots. It's, it's a process. It's a journey, isn't it? How do I get my ball from here into here? That's it. Right. And it doesn't matter how you do it. And we often, you know, it's a, it's a cliche, isn't it? You know, there's yeah. no room on the scorecard that describes how you did it or you're putting down as a number. And we can't get away from the fact that it's just a number. So just embrace the fact it's a number and try to get the lowest number possible. And it so, doesn't matter. How you do it. So along those lines, I'm, I'm guessing then you would tend, uh, you've spoken about skill over technique. Uh, technique's important, but skill development is thing. Is, is a very important thing, you know, shot making, you know, being prepared for anything. Um, but a lot of that is kind of, I don't know if it's learned because sometimes just by playing a lot, stuff happens and you don't realize you're learning, but you get in certain situations more often. So you're more prepared. So you more, are you more advising that just go out and play despite the score and, and just go see what, yeah. where your golf ball rolls and play it from there? Yeah, totally. Totally. And, and if, if parents want to know what to do with their kids, go play. Just go play. And, um, you know, some, some parents have asked me before, you know, well, what tees do I play them off? Play them off whatever tees you want to. 
well, you know, he feels like the course is too short. Okay, we'll just lengthen a couple of holes. Play off different tees. Yeah. You know, agree before you go out and play the yardages you want to play on each hole that's out there. Challenge each other. Do different things, but just play golf. Um, and we, we get stuck in this um, in this time warp, really. You know, where we constantly feel that you know swinging the club perfectly is the secret to to playing at the highest level, and and, mm-hmm. it, and it really isn't necessarily. No, it really isn't. <clears throat> One more. I've kept you for so long, and it's been so insightful. Grant Waite, um, you know Grant well, a fantastic golfer in his own right, good golf instructor, and he learned the game with a limited number of golf clubs in his bag. It was, it wasn't because it just was. That's how it was, and he still and has advised folks on this podcast to, you know, learners go out there with only certain clubs and learn to be, you said it earlier, creative and learn to realize that, you know, sometimes I got to make, you know, uh, sunshine out of, out of clouds and I got to somehow find a way to survive whatever's going on. Yeah. Um, you, you've got a, a, you've got a set of tools. You've got 14 tools in your bag that can do different things. And we're trying to use them to the best of our ability or, you know, for the main reason that these different clubs were, were created. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a, it's, it's a stick that's designed to propel the ball from A to B, right. In, in a certain direction, right. And just go and use the clubs, go and go and just go play. Mm-hmm. It, it's as simple as that. And I think, um, you know, I never saw a drive range for the first seven years of my golfing life. Um, I was brought up in the Isle of Man and there were no driving ranges. We had a practice area, Mm -hmm. Um, but we never really hit balls. We just played and played and played sometimes three rounds, sometimes four rounds per day in the summer. And it was, it was, it was all the education that we needed, just the ability to get the ball in the hole, you figure it out. Um, And we don't often give enough credit to kids for their ability to figure things out. They're wonderfully intuitive, you know, their learning curve and their, their, their growth spur and maturation is that the curve is so steep when they're really young. Just so let them experience it. You know, they will figure it out. Yeah. That curve is not a straight line. Sadly, it's got a lot of humps and hollows, but as long as it's trending in the right direction, Um, Gavin, tremendous stuff. Uh, You've been so gracious with your time. Thank you. Um, The insights have been awesome. Uh, If folks want to find out more, share the social media handles or where they can reach you uh, and the like. Yeah, um, at Led Better Kids uh, on Instagram. Okay. And at Gavin GW13 on Instagram as well. Lots of um, different uh, stories on there um, with the journey of my kids and, uh, of course, the kids that we coach. And there's some parenting themes, um, developmental themes, um, you know, personal strength themes, just stuff that's designed really to help people Mm. and what's good news is is we're talking about kids in this but you know all of us are mature in different stages of the game so i might be 50 but i might still be a kid in golf and there's a lot still to learn so everyone can learn and i'm going to share my parting shot and i want you to share yours you use tools uh you know for the 14 tools you have in your bag i used to um now i now I've, i've gravitated with youngsters to call these magic ones yeah, because I don't want you to say this is just a hammer and I'm only going to do this with this tool. You can make that golf ball do anything if you begin to understand really how the process happens yeah. and how you can be creative and how you can modify and how you can make things happen. So that's my parting shot. What's yours? Well, I, I like that because you can have a, a I like the um, two clubs in a putter tournament. Mm-hmm. I used to do that with the kids I coached at college. Um, that was a fun game as much as the other fun game was then, you know, these 20 year olds playing off the red tees or the ladies tees, yeah. whatever, um, just different ways. And, and again, it's, it's, it's experiencing different ways to play the game, putting yourself in situations, um, that you can learn from so that when you are in the heat of the moment and you're competing, you're, you're vaguely familiar with what it feels like to be in that situation at that time. And then you have a chance, you know, that familiarity will uh, give you some confidence and it will give you a vision. And I think that will help you execute the shot. 
So sensational stuff, mate. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. And uh, good luck over the next couple of days walking around the golf course.